Today we begin a new series called Finding Your Way Back to God. This is a series about the initial time that we find our way to God and begin a relationship with Him. But it's also about the ongoing journey of finding our way back to God. Yes, you see, we find our way back to God sometimes in a life-changing moment when it's that first instance and, and we, everything just seems to change in that moment. But there's also this ongoing process, this ongoing journey that we find ourselves on in finding our way back to God. You see, time after time, we've wandered away from home. Time after time, we've forgotten about God. And time after time, we've completely turned our backs on God. Throughout the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at specifically five awakenings that we see that literally take place in kind of everybody's spiritual journey. And as we take a look at these five awakenings, I, I think you'll begin to see even your own story unfolding. As we look at these, today we begin with the first one, uh, this awakening to longing. An awakening to longing. The first awakening is all about recognizing our longing for love and purpose and meaning. And it's not satisfied by running from God, but this longing is satisfied only in running toward God. Real quickly, let's look at just a few examples of people's stories as they found their way back to God. My father was an alcoholic, so I grew up in that type of a, of a home. Once I became of age, drinking was just natural. I saw it, I did it, participated in it, got heavy into it. My first marriage was not very successful, and it ended fairly, fairly soon. I had a daughter with my first wife, and I was very into being a, a daddy. Having my daughter gone was very, very difficult. Uh, and it was probably at that time, as far as from a drinking standpoint, I got a lot heavier. Got married again, got into the same, same habits, same routine. My first marriage lasted five years. I had a daughter, got divorced. My second marriage lasted five years. I had a daughter, got divorced. Didn't really learn from my experiences. It was more a day-to-day, -day, I want to feel good today, however that was alcohol, sex, success at work. Uh, there was no real foundation of anything significant that I was searching for. That was rock bottom for me. I've had two failed marriages in 10 years, two daughters that are no longer with me on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm by myself at this point. My journey started when I was two years old and my mom and my um, dad divorced. And I, we had lived with my grandmother for a long time and she had then at the mo at the time gave us an ultimatum to stay with her or to leave and my grandmother and I did not have a good relationship my mother and my grandmother did not have a good relationship I met my ex-husband when I was a junior um, it was great in the beginning I didn't really know who I was though at 16 17 years old to be in, in love or even know what it meant it was just something was missing but I just was so in the moment and wanted like to get married and the whole fairy tale that I kind of pushed those feelings aside. Um, once we had my daughter, it definitely took a turn for the worse. His behavior changed and my behavior changed and I wanted out about a year after. And so I stuck with it for a little bit longer and we went to therapy. And then once I found out I was pregnant with my son, I felt like I was just stuck. I, you know, I have two kids and I definitely don't want to be a single mom with two kids. So I knew something had to change, and I just kind of went the wrong way to make that change. I had an affair, and then on Father's Day weekend, I had another affair, and the man that I had an affair with ended up being my boyfriend for a few years after me and my ex-husband separated. I think from the beginning of being with a grandmother that treated me like a piece of crap, to now being in a relationship that I'm just destroyed and slept with multiple men, but there was no God. And if he was there, he was not a nice person. Uh, I grew up in a, a Christian home um, with two parents who also grew up in, 
in Christian families. When I was young, about seven, my, my parents moved to a camp in Central Illinois, a Christian youth camp. And that was a really, really cool way to grow up, uh, just surrounded by youth groups and, and Christian kids. And coupled with that, I also grew up in the church, surrounded by a family that uh, didn't just believe it, but they lived it. For me, growing up, uh, the key word, I think, in my family would be acceptance. Uh, I didn't find that out till later, that that was a key word, but it was exactly what I knew growing up. No matter what I did, I would always be loved. Um, exactly as I am in any moment. You know, I had a faith, I saw how it had played out in my family's lives, but I did not have a direction. And I did not have a purpose that I felt like I was being pulled towards or, or called to. Just kind of searching, longing for a fulfillment that it seemed like everybody else in my family had and I just hadn't found yet. Have you ever found yourself feeling like Bryce and baby Carissa or Jake? Maybe your story isn't as dramatic as theirs, but you felt similar emptiness at times in your life. You know what it's like to have longings that have gone unfulfilled. You know what it's like to end up in a place that you never really intended to be. And maybe even in this moment, you're pondering in, in your own life and you find yourself thinking, there's got to be more. There's got to be more to, to life than this. You, maybe you find yourself as you're feeling that there's got to be more, that you're having this awakening to this longing, that deep down inside of you there's something missing, that even with all of the things that, that life can offer, there's still something just missing from your life. You see, we can find this longing for awakening, this awakening for longing um, in books that have been written, in stories that we write. We, we can see it in the art that we create. We can also see it in, in the songs that have been written throughout the years. Here's a couple of them. Maybe you can finish the song for me. I'll kind of get you going and you see if you can finish the end for me. You can't always get what what you want. You can't always get what you want. But I still haven't found what I'm searching for. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. There's that longing that we still have to find something that's just not there in our lives. A lot of times we play these songs over in our life. One of the major, there's kind of three major things that I believe every person has a longing for. The first one is a longing for love. A longing for love. And I think Glenn Wolf holds the record for longing for love, if you will. You see, he actually holds the record for the most number of marriages in the United States. Can anybody guess how many marriages this Glenn Wolf has had? Five is very way too low. 32 is close. 29. 29 marriages. His longest marriage lasted seven years, and his shortest one was 19 days. But you want to know the most interesting detail about this Glenn Wolf. I'm not proud to say this, but he was a Baptist minister, a Baptist pastor. But you see, what I want to know is why didn't Glenn Wolf stop at like three, or um, why didn't he stop at like 25? Why did he keep pursuing these relationships? What was he trying to find? You see, after all of these hard relationships, he still had this longing and this desire that he was trying to find love. But you see, he was trying to find it in the wrong places. He was trying to find love in places that could not satisfy his true desire for the love that was inside of him. Why is it when we get hurt, 
when we have friendships that fail? Why is it that we, we still turn around and we still put ourselves out there and, and we still seek to find love in relationships and we still seek to find new friends even though some friends have hurt us? Why? It's because deep down we have a desire to be loved. We have a longing to be loved. Another one that we have is a, long, a longing for purpose in our life. Think back to when you were a kid, maybe six years old or so. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? What, what did you want to be when you grew up? I'm sure all of us can think of something that you wanted to be when you grew up. Maybe it was a doctor or a teacher. Uh, maybe a fireman or an astronaut. You know, for me, it, it was I wanted to be an FBI profiler. I, I wanted to, to be a baseball player. So now ask yourself, why in the world were we dreaming about having that kind of influence, having those kind of jobs in the world when we were six? We didn't have a need for money. We didn't need to have a job. We, we didn't need to, to pay any bills. We, we were learning the alphabet for Pete's sakes. Why, why did we think that we had to have some great job when we grew up? Because deep down inside of each one of us, we already had a longing for a purpose. We already had a desire to want to achieve something, to, to leave our mark on the world. We wanted to have a purpose, a mission for what we were here for. We also have a meaning, a, a lo sorry, we also have a longing for meaning. A longing for meaning. One of the ways that we can find this longing for meaning is the why questions that we ask. Because throughout our lives, we've asked God the question, if God, if you're so good, why would you allow this to happen to me? What is, what is the point that I'm supposed to get out, out of this circumstance in my life? I, I don't get it. Why am I in so much pain? If suffering is causing you to question God, think about this. There's a reason why, why suffering feels not just painful, but also wrong and unfair. There's a reason behind that. And the reason that we feel that way is that your life and, and the world that you're in aren't the way they're supposed to be. You see, God created the world in perfect harmony. But yet, that's not what we find the world to be in today. Understanding our longing for love and our longing for purpose and answers to the big why questions, we all experience them. We all experience those things in our life. We're all hired, hardwired with longings. So please understand this. The problem isn't that we have longings and desires. That's not the problem. The problem isn't that we seek, the problem is that we seek to fulfill them on our own. The problem is that we try and satisfy these longings for love and purpose and meaning and answer these questions without God. We try to do it all without him. But here's the good news. This awakening to longing and to the truth about where they can be satisfied is a longing for ultimately God. You see, our lives, our being, was created to ultimately desire a relationship with God. But yet we try and fulfill that desire and those longings with everything else but God. So we look this morning, as we'll look throughout this series, at a familiar story to probably most of you, but maybe not to everyone. It's the story of a son who kind of loses his way. Earlier you heard the, the scripture being read um, in, in the video of the prodigal son or the lost son. We find that he just, he has a longing for something more in his life. 
You see, in the Middle Eastern culture, asking your father for his inheritance was one of the worst things that you could do to a father. A son in Jesus' time was not only expected to work his father's property and his land, but he was also expected to take care of his father when he grew old. And so for this son to to go to his father and say, I want my inheritance now. What he was literally saying was, look, dad, I don't really care if you live or die anymore. I just know there's something more in this life and I want it now. In that time, that was one of the worst things that a father could have his son ask him. I want us to wait a minute before we cast judgment on this son. And we begin to think the worst of this son. You see, because we see him and we think that maybe he's ungrateful and he's selfish and we're quick to give him those labels. But is it possible he just said out loud what most of us are thinking? Is it possible that he said what we really feel? Don't we sometimes feel like life isn't bringing us what we hoped for? Or what we wanted or what we even feel like we deserve? Haven't we all had times in our life where we felt like we deserved more? I don't know about you, but I know I have. What I'm about to say next may surprise you a little bit, and hopefully it will. But thinking and feeling that you want something more is what you should feel. Thinking and feeling that you want something more is what you should feel. It's literally how you were created. It's how God created you as a person, as a human being, to be, to have these longings in your life. Not that everything that you should desire is good for you, because it's not. Yet things you're longing for, for love that will truly last and purpose that will truly be living inside of you and and your need to make sense out of the hard things in life, those are all put there by God for you. But the son in Jesus' story was like so many of us. He was convinced that he had to leave the father in order to find those things. So Jesus says in Luke 15, 13, says that the son, he set off for a distant country. You see, the son felt like he had to leave the father in order to to gain the things that he longed for. You see, we have all of our longings fulfilled in one person, God. But yet, we don't turn to God to satisfy those longings. Because for whatever reason, the world has told us that we shouldn't be satisfied with those simple longings that he meets. Be honest with yourself. Does God fulfill the longing for love in your life? Can God fulfill the the purpose for your life? The meaning that you have? Can you find those things in God? The story doesn't give us many details about the son, but it says, that in continuing on in verse 13, it says the younger son, he went to another country and he squandered his wealth in wild living. This is kind of a a dangerous, you know, verse to just leave out there because it just kind of lets our minds go to work. And we get to fill in the blanks of what this wild living was that, that he gave his life to. You know, if we were to put this story in today's terms, I, I think we might say that, you know, he, he went to Vegas and he went to fulfill all of his, his dreams. You know, he, he went to play, the, you know, all of the, the casinos in order to hopefully make it rich with the little inheritance he might have gotten from his father. 
He went to Vegas because, you know, Vegas, you can get all of your sexual desires met there. So maybe that was part of it. I can just picture him kind of maybe drinking. Maybe just binge drinking and it, because he still can't find that satisfaction that he's looking for. But it doesn't take long before he blows his inheritance. He's lost it all. And his adventure for longing quickly goes bad. A famine strikes the land and, and he doesn't have any money to buy any food. So it says in verse 15 and 16, it says, So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to feed his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I'm a little behind. He longed to feed his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. That's kind of the bottom, I think. You know, I, I think that what this passage is saying is that the other workers wouldn't give him any. But when I read this, I think, man, he, he really hit bottom because he was like begging the pigs for their food. Because that's kind of how it reads and how it, you know, kind of your mind just kind of works. He, he was looking for food but couldn't even find it among the animals that he was feeding. His longing for love wasn't satisfied with the women. His longing for purpose wasn't found in his partying. And his journey left him asking all of the why questions. Why is this happening to me? Why, God, do I deserve this? And the reason Jesus told this story is to help each of us find our way back to God. So this be, brings us to life's most important question. Where will we go to satisfy our God-given longings? Where will we go to satisfy the things that God put into our lives for a purpose? Will it draw us closer to God or will it take us away from God? Where will you go to find satisfaction for what God has given you as longings? Listen to this. That, that story of the lost son is every one of our stories. Uh, that's why Jesus told the story, to help each of us find our way home, to help us find our way back to God. And what the story does, it introduces one of life's really big questions. And that is, where will we go to satisfy these longings we have for love and for purpose and for meaning? Will those longings drive us away from God or will they bring us back closer to God? John and I have had the opportunity to interview, well, really hundreds of people and, and see thousands more walk a similar path. And that path always included five spiritual awakenings on their way back to God. And in the next sessions, what we want to do is we want to introduce you to these five spiritual awakenings. And here's my sincere hope. It's this that you will find your way back to God, maybe for the first time, or like me, maybe one more time. The 17th century mathematician Blaise Pascal had one of the greatest intellects in the history of Western civilization. He grew up knowing about God, but not earnestly following Him. Then, in a profound middle-of-the-night experience with God, he had a change of heart. That experience ignited Pascal's passion to help others find their way back to God. Pascal began to challenge his fellow intellectuals to a wager on God. He would dare them to step into a belief about God and see if it didn't change their lives. Pascal explained his wager this way, Make a bet that there is a God who loves you. If you are right, you have everything to gain. And if you are wrong, you have nothing to lose. Make a bet that God is real. It's a gamble where you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. If you find God, you will find the source of unconditional love for which you have always longed. Finding God will offer you a purpose for your life. And God is the one who can take your past and make sense out of it. That's a big time payoff. The risk I want you to take is this. 
pray to God. If that's not a common practice for you, it may seem awkward at first, but I want you to try it. I would pray, but I didn't know who I was praying to. I wouldn't sit there like I do now and know who I'm talking to. I just kind of, someone's there, so hear me. I knew what I was doing was wrong, uh, but still, to, you know, I broke away from it because to get back into a relationship with God meant I had to admit to a lot of things. I had to ask for a lot of forgiveness and a lot of internal conviction that was gonna take place. I didn't wanna do any of that. For others, prayer is a regular part of your life. Maybe so regular that at times it becomes a little routine. Either way, I want you to open yourself up to finding God in a deeper and more life-changing way than ever before. As I was laying there, I just kept remembering this prayer from a book about a Celtic monk that I loved growing up. My dad introduced me to the author. The prayer that he goes to anytime he doesn't know what to do is, Lord have mercy. And it's just, he repeats it. It just becomes this meditation. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Knowing the whole time and kind of laughing at myself that like, I really don't deserve this, but asking anyway and receiving it. So here's exactly what I'm asking you to do. Pray as if God is real every single day for the next 30 days. And here's the first of five prayers I'm gonna ask you to pray. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me the ability to see that you are what's missing from my life. So if you're a person that's trying to find your way back to God, maybe for the first time, maybe for many times, I know for me, I can find a place in my life where I can say, okay, this was the one moment where I had that conversion experience where I fully just gave my life to God and, and my life began to change from that moment on. But I can also point to times in my life where I had this awakening, where I had this moment in my life that I felt like something was missing, where I was desiring more than the things that I had could give me. And it was only when I finally turned to God to fulfill those desires that I felt complete in what I was looking for. And so what I want to do is I want to extend that invitation that Dave and John on the video extended to you was to take this wager that Pascal gave to his fellow intellects. God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. And I, I love this because I love how he explains it. Because if, if God is real, then you have everything to gain. You have nothing to lose if God is real by praying this prayer. But if God isn't real, what have you lost? You haven't lost anything, right? So this is a, a wager, a bet worth taking. You're not gonna get these odds at the racetrack. You're not gonna find this at the casino. It's, it's like a perfect bet. So... I offer Pascal's wager to you to pray for 30 days. And what I've done is, is I've put together this, this little booklet of the 30-day prayer wager. On the tables as you leave, I have booklets available for you. If we run out of copies, let me know. I will print some off and I will personally hand deliver them to you tomorrow so that you have them. And it goes through each day. And it challenges you to think about specific things each day during these 30 days. And then there's a point for you to journal. Why journal? I don't like to journal. I don't write to write in a journal. And get out your computer and type if that makes you feel better and makes you feel more manly and so on and so forth. Uh, but what, what's the benefit of writing things out? Well, let me tell you the benefit that I've found. When I write things out, my mind is focused on literally what I'm writing. But sometimes when I just think and try and process things, 
Oh wait, I've got to answer the phone that's ringing. Oh wait, I've got to do this later tomorrow. And I've got to, I start thinking of everything else but what I'm supposed to focus on. So if you're not into journaling, that's fine. You don't have to keep a special little book and all that stuff. Just get a piece of paper and write out and process your thoughts with a pencil so that you can focus solely on the questions that are being asked. So I challenge you to, to do this. I, I challenge you to ask that question. Each week we'll have a, a new prayer that will kind of go along with each longing. So the, the first one for the awakening, the longing, the prayers, God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me the ability to see that you are what's missing from my life. Awaken in me the ability to see that you are what's missing from my life. As you leave, and if you pick up one of these and you are going to take the 30-day prayer wager, what, what I would ask of you is there's a clipboard on each side. If you would just put your name on the clipboard just to let me know that hey I'm doing this so that I can also be praying for you so that it's just not you praying this but I can specifically lift you in prayer and ask God to, to speak to you during this time so if you would please uh, sign the, the clipboard as you leave obviously there's a lot to what we've been talking about today in this, in this awakening to longing. And so Tuesday, we're gonna start a life group here at the church at 6.30. So Tuesday, this coming Tuesday at 6.30. And we're gonna take a deeper look at, at this awakening to longing. Uh, this is a safe place to kind of process these questions. This isn't a, a place to come to get the newest gossip to go tell you know, your friends, hey, did you know so-and-so? No, this, this is a community that will be open to, to share and, and to speak into each other's lives and, and help us learn from each other how to live this life that God has called us to, how to find fulfillment in, in the longings that God has given us. So I, I pray that each one of us would take this journey. And if you know someone specifically in your neighborhood or you know, a friend or a family member that you think that this would be great for them to, to see, to, to realize, to walk through, pick up a copy of the prayer wager with them. The first page kind of explains a little bit about what it is. But challenge them to take the wager a wager that they lose nothing by doing, but they gain everything if God is real.